And you know when that day comes, I will not have to run to the balcony <laughs> to turn on internet equipment or up to the sound room to turn on sound equipment. In a nobler, sweeter tongue, I'll sing that power to save. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're moving toward the end of the book, only two chapters to go. We move into chapter 27 tonight. Sailing slow after fast. A play on words. Last week we ended with almost believing is not enough, part four. Tonight we start chapter 27, verses 1 through 12. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. And entering into a ship of Adramitium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Cnidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmone. And hardly passing it, we came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the leading and the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice, and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's word. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. We pray that as we look into what on the surface appears only to be an historical narrative, we might understand how you, the God of history, control all things. You are sovereign. And for that we thank you. You are a gracious Lord, a gracious King, a gracious God, a gracious Savior, and through us you demonstrate your grace to those who are lost. Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now last week we finished a series on how genuine faith will change your life and the way that you live. In other words, the difference between really believing and being a phony, which was illustrated to us by King Agrippa. We saw that faith, as a definition, is faith is complete confidence in the word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. If he had not revealed himself, you would not be able to believe in him, for human reason does not come up with the type of God that the Bible portrays. We saw the connection between faith as in every believer, spiritual gift, and saving faith. That brought us to the essential basic propositions, the balancing propositions about faith, which is Paul sets faith in contrast to works, in Ephesians, James said faith in complement to works. I gave you at least five ways the term faith is used in the Bible, especially the New Testament. Saving faith, sanctifying faith, the spiritual gift of faith, faith as the fruit of the Spirit, and the faith once and for all delivered unto the saints. We looked at the description of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, excuse me, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That brought us to a dual conclusion, genuine faith always results in action, and genuine faith always results in works of righteousness. We saw that especially in James chapter 2. In summary, we saw that genuine faith is much more than the intellectual knowledge that Agrippa had, and so we know for sure that Agrippa did not have saving faith, because he did not have corresponding works. We saw that there are two key elements that are always present with faith in works. 
One, faith always precedes works of genuine righteousness, not sometimes, but always. And two, faith always produces works of genuine righteousness, not sometimes, but always. That's why you can't do good works to obtain salvation. That's always why you cannot claim to be saved, even though you never do any good works from the divine perspective, because God foreordains good works that you should walk in them. God has predestined those good works to be done by the elect to demonstrate and to prove that they have saving faith. We saw that there are at least 10 false ways that good works are defined by pagan religions, legalists, and the world and the devil. Biblical good works are not defined by cultural standards, by reason, by humanitarian standards, by government welfare programs, by social mores, by vote of the people, by political agenda, by extra biblical revelation or religious texts, by emotionalism and empathetic appeals, or by the law. None of those things relate to good works. In contrast, we saw the Bible gives a fourfold standard for good works that please God. All truly good works will be done with these four elements. Number one, in the power of the Holy Spirit, not the power of the flesh. Two, to the glory of God. Three, in obedience to the word of God. And four, works that are done by faith, not by the compulsion of the law or by some other standard. Anything that misses even one of those cannot be counted as a good work in the sight of God. We learn four specific things from that passage in Ephesians 2.10 where it talks about our predestinated good works. Number one, we are God's workmanship, not our own workmanship. The potter makes the pot as he will. We looked at uh, the book of Romans, chapters 8, 9, and 10. The pot doesn't will how it gets made. The creator does. You don't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Number two, God created us in Christ Jesus. That's positional sanctification that we've been studying on Sunday mornings. Number three, God created us in a certain way unto good works. Just like he created birds and fish to do what they do. Birds to fly, fish to swim. These are things that we must do. He created us unto good works. Number four, he specifically predestined which good works we would do. God hath before ordained. Then we learn that there are seven things, specific things, that the Bible teaches us about good works and the plan of God. God defines good works, he commands good works, he empowers good works, he determines good works, he motivates good works, he rewards us for good works, and he holds us accountable for doing them or not for doing them. And that is where we differ from fatalism, as we'll see in a moment. Good works are not what we determine are good works. Good works must follow the express instructions given by God, that fourfold test for good works that I just gave you. We answered the pagan, children, uh, pagan challenge of it's not fair for God to hold us accountable for not doing good works if he's the one who predestines them. We saw that that has threefold answer. Number one, if unfairness is true in terms of holding us accountable, the opposite is also true. It's unfair for him to give us heavenly rewards for doing the good works since he's the one that ordained them, empowered them, and caused them. Answer number two, the correct response is salvation is all of God and nothing of man. God chooses to exercise grace toward us and give us that which we do not deserve. If he gave us what we deserved, we'd all end up in hell. Answer number three was, when people complain about God sending somebody to hell, the question is not, how can a loving God send anybody to heaven? The real question is, how can a just God, uh, excuse me, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? The real question is, how can a just God send anyone to heaven? And that question is answered by the cross. Then we showed the difference between predestination that produces salvation and good works versus fatalism. Fatalism and predestination are not the same thing. I hope you've gotten that. In predestination, there is moral responsibility. In fatalism, there is no moral responsibility. In fatalism, there is no moral accountability. Fatalism says that a man wants to escape, can do and escape the jaws of the inevitable, but he never can do it because fate is against him. Fatalism starts by viewing man as noble and moral. Predestination starts by viewing man as sinful and fallen. You have to start with the right premise. Fatalism starts with the wrong view of man. That's why it ends in hopelessness. Predestination starts with the view that man is depraved, rothy, rotten, filthy, and a vile sinner. Not only is there nothing good that he can do in the sight of a holy God, but more importantly, there is nothing that he wants to do that is right. The Bible presents man as being in a rebellious struggle against a merciful and gracious God who has paid an infinite price for salvation, not the Bible does not present man as a great hero struggling against a capricious God. We show the difference or the connection between faith and good works in the book of James. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Faith has to be alive, not dead. Genuine faith is working faith. Faith does not exist in a vacuum as an intangible, impractical, vague concept. Genuine faith is alive. It functions in the real world. It's made visible by the results that it produces. 
Faith means that we believe the word of God on whatever subject matter is at hand. And we saw that God is both starts it and ends it. The book of Hebrews portrays God as the author of faith, that's salvation, and the finisher of our faith, that's sanctification. All of that is from God, it's not from us. Faith is not stagnant in the book of James. It's clear that God designs to make our faith grow by allowing us to go through the trials of life. Things that are active and alive grow and mature. Things that are dead do not grow. If you don't have growing faith, maybe you don't have faith. James claims that genuine faith will always be profitable to the body of Christ. We spent a good deal of time on that. The body of Christ, of course, is the church, not merely to the individual who has faith. Your faith healers tell you if you have enough faith, it's going to benefit you. The get-rich-quick scheme people tell you if you have enough faith, you'll get rich. Genuine faith, according to the book of James, is not a matter of being profitable to you. It's a matter of being profitable to the body of Christ, to the church, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Last week, we saw the connection between the doctrines of justification and imputation and how faith relates to both of those. We saw that imputation is the doctrine that tells us we are made righteous by faith alone. We saw there are two stages to the doctrine of imputation. Number one, God transfers the sin of the world to Christ on the cross. Number two, God transfers divine righteousness of Christ to those who believe in him, faith. It's not enough to have all the sins of the world placed on Christ because they're still dead in their trespasses and sins. You have to have divine righteousness transferred to your account to be saved. And that is given to all those whom God has chosen and to whom he gives faith. Without the transfer of divine righteousness, that step two man cannot get into heaven. Only the elect, those whom God has given saving faith to, have divine righteousness transferred or imputed to their account. Then we contrasted that and showed the difference with the doctrine of justification. Justification is not what makes us righteous. The doctrine of justification is what declares us righteous. We're declared righteous in the sight of God, emphasize that, in the sight of God by faith alone. He can see our hearts, but the world can't. Romans 3.20, 3.24, 3.28, Galatians 2.16, Galatians 3.11, all of those make it very clear that God looks into the heart and what he sees there, if he sees faith, we are declared righteous based on that. We are already made righteous through imputation, but we are declared righteous through justification. In the sight of God, he can see our internal faith, man cannot. But we are declared righteous in the sight of men, emphasized in the sight of men. We are declared righteous, are justified in the sight of men by our works. We saw that James was very careful to distinguish between justified and imputed when talking about the visible actions of two of the heroes of faith, a good man, Abraham, and a bad woman, Rahab, in James chapter 2, verses 21 uh, through 26. James uses the term justified when he talks about their actions as seen by others, but he uses imputed when he talks about Abraham's righteousness before God, for example, James 2.23. Paul uses those terms in exactly the same way and in contrast to one another. They are not synonymous terms. Paul uses them the same way we looked at in Romans chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. Then we close with final three thoughts about faith and works. Number one, faith can grow. Faith can grow. That's what Jesus told the disciples in Luke 17, 3 through 6. The word of encouragement to us when we see how little fruit of faith we have in some of our lives, or in other words, the lack of truly good works. Number two, we saw growing faith is permanently linked to scripture. It is permanently linked to scripture. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Number three, faith is powerfully linked and connected to prayer. That's James chapter one, verses six through eight. That's where you're asking God for something and not getting it because you don't ask in faith. James one, six through eight, but let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And then we closed last week with the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4, verses 13 through 20, when we saw that connection to prayer, and asked the question, is there any fruit in your life that proves that your heart is good soil that has received the word and is now producing fruit in your visible life so that the world might know. Remember, faith without works is dead being alone. And that's what brings us to chapter 27, verses 1 through 12. Now, I've just read that for you, and I hope you picked up on the number of people and places that are mentioned in that passage. They're not mentioned for no reason at all, just because God wanted to make the New Testament a little bit longer because he saw it was too short. Specific people are mentioned. Specific groups of people are mentioned. We have specific names that are mentioned. 
We have a guy by the name of Julius, the centurion of Augustus' band. We have a man by the name of Aristarchus, a Macedonian. We have a group of sailors mentioned. We have a group of prisoners mentioned. We have others traveling on the ship who are mentioned. We find multiple locations that are mentioned. Macedonia, Thessalonica, Sidon. We find Cyprus is mentioned in Sicilia and Pamphylia and Myra. We found a ship of Alexandria. We find Italy mentioned. We find Tinnitus and Crete and Salmone. We find the Fair Havens. We find Lycia. You know, we find a lot of specific details about this voyage. Why does God give us so much detail about people, places, and things? Is because he's teaching us some lessons that apply to us. I hope you'll see that tonight as we go through this passage. The first thing that we notice as we look at the passage is it gives us an illustration of a man who started in unbelief but later believes the words of Paul in total contrast to Agrippa. Agrippa is a man who knew it all. He knew the scriptures. He knew the prophecies. He didn't believe, although he had it in his head. And that's proved the way he worked, what he did, his acts. Now we're going to find a man who is a centurion. He's a Gentile. He's a pagan. He doesn't know anything about the Bible. He doesn't know anything about the Old Testament. He certainly doesn't know anything about the life of Jesus. All he knows is he's got a prisoner that he's got to deliver to Rome. He starts out in unbelief. He starts out by not believing the words of the Apostle Paul. But he's not a man of faith. Verse 11 says, Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than the things which were spoken by Paul. It nearly cost him his life, but God had mercy on him for the sake of Paul and for the testimony that Paul would bear to all those people that were on board that ship. We find that he was not a particularly nasty man. He's clearly a kind man. You see that in verse 3. The next day we touched down at Sidon, and Julius, there he's mentioned again by name, like in verse 1, courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. Julius understands the context. Julius understands he's been briefed on what's with this prisoner and why he's on his way to Rome. He knows that Agrippa has, you know, made it clear with the council that really we could let this guy go if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. But Agrippa also understands that he lets Paul go in the context where he has him. The Jews will, of course, try to assassinate him. He'll have another riot on his hands. He'll have another rebellion on his hands. He's going to have a problem which is going to make its way back to Rome. And Caesar's going to write back and say, what's the matter with you guys over there? Can't you control that riotous mob of illiterates that keep running around trying to kill one guy? Julius understands Paul's really not guilty. He gives him sure liberty. And you know something? He's not afraid Paul's going to run away. Isn't that interesting? You see, Paul's the one who made the appeal to Caesar. Paul wants to have his day in court. Paul wants Caesar to hear the gospel of Christ. Paul has already been told that he's going to preach to kings. And he thinks, man, I can't think of anybody higher than Caesar. Let's give it a shot. Julius is obviously a kind man. But he's a pragmatist rather than a man of faith, as we see from verse 11. Later, he chooses to believe Paul in a crisis situation when it really matters. Right here, he's not believing Paul, but there's no crisis. Later, he's going to believe Paul when here the sailors say, listen, we've, we've got to let some lifeboats out of the ship because we have to cast anchors. And Paul says to him, look, if they leave the ship, he understands why they're leaving the ship. They're trying to run away. They're going to let the ship sink. If they leave the ship, Everybody on board is going to drown. And at that point, the centurion believes Paul. What do you think made the difference? We're going to see that as we move through the narrative and all the different things begin to happen. As, as they go through this crisis situation, as the centurion begins to see how the sailors respond, as the centurion sees how Paul responds, as the centurion sees how Paul has a, a positive effect on all the passengers in the ship, the centurion's going to learn who he can trust and who he can't trust. Question. People may start out not believing when we give our initial testimony to them. But as they watch your life, what do they see? Do they begin to perceive a difference between you and the other people whom perhaps they have been trusting? 
people that they thought in rational terms would be the people that they could trust, but they suddenly begin to realize there is a difference in your life. Something changes between the time they get on board the ship and the time that the centurion orders them to cut the ropes of the boats and let the boats fall away and let the ship sail toward the shore. Something happens. It's a transfer of trust. You know, if people can't trust you and me, and we're the visible representations of the Lord Jesus, how can they trust him? If our faith, which is what we've just been talking about, hasn't made a difference in our life, how can we expect them to believe? I think it's by no accident that we see Julius immediately after we see Agrippa. Because Agrippa was a man who knew it for a long time and never really believed. Julius is a man who never knew it at all and whose life is changed and we see that by what he does. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Second. We see the principle of the sovereignty of God at work in eight ways. I hope you're taking notes. I give you lists. I give you lists for a purpose. <laughs> Here we're going to see, this is point two. We're going to see the principle of the sovereignty of God at work in eight specific ways. Number one, and these are listed for us in the passage. Number one, we see not just a specific ship, we see two specific ships are mentioned. Number two, we see a specific time. Number three, we see a specific location. Actually, we see a series of specific locations. Some places that the ship wasn't planning to go, but God guaranteed that it went there specific locations. Number four, a specific centurion whose life is going to be changed. A specific centurion whose life is going to be changed. Two specific groups, a specific group of prisoners and a specific group of sailors. Because it says there are a bunch of prisoners that were delivered to Julius, not just Paul. We see number six, a specific destination. A specific destination. The ultimate destination is Rome, but there are a lot of stops along the way, and some of those stops get changed. We see, in addition to those two groups I mentioned, the prisoners and the sailors, we also see a specific group of passengers one of whom is named a believer upon whom Paul is going to make an impact. A man who will later bear testimony as to what occurred. And number eight, a specific divinely ordained storm. A specific divinely ordained storm which is totally under the control of God as to its timing, its duration, its intensity, its direction, and its control of a specific tiny little ship, a dot in the ocean. And all of this is of God. Nothing of man. It is all of God. Just like we were talking about in relation to faith in the preceding passage. Nothing of man, all of God. Point number three. The third thing that we see, these exact same elements, now get this carefully, these exact same elements are always found in God's direction for our lives. These same specific elements are always found in God's direction for our lives. Number one, 
specific temporal items. We saw a specific ship, in fact, two specific ships. Specific temporal items like the ship that God is going to use. You're surrounded by specific temporal items. You're wearing some of them tonight, your clothing. You have specific items in your pocket. You have specific items in your handbag. You have a specific vehicle out in the parking lot. I don't think any of you all walked here to church tonight. You have specific things in your house or your apartment. You have specific things that are in the bank or uh, securities that you hold. You have specific temporal items that are part of your environment. And you know what? Those temporal items are what God is going to be using in your life with the tests that God gives to you. He surrounds us with specific temporal resources that he uses in all the tests of our lives. He's not going to use something that some guy in India owns as a test in your life unless that guy comes in contact with you. He's going to use the things that he gave you. How you deal with resources. Number two, we saw that these events took place at a specific time. God uses specific timing in your life and in my life. You and I are not here by accident at this point in history. We are not here at this church building tonight by accident. Some of you are sitting out there watching this on the internet. You are not there by accident. Some of you had communicated with me a couple of weeks ago that you couldn't see us on the internet. So perhaps tonight you're not out there. <laughs> And I don't see you, and I don't know if you can see me. But there are specific timings to the things that take place in our lives. Have you ever wondered why there are certain, for example, automobile accidents that occur? Have you ever been in a situation where you think, Wow, that guy just ran a red light in front of me. If I had been one second earlier in putting my foot on the gas, he would have hit me broadside. I've had situations like that. Did you know there are no accidents in the plan of God, only incidents? There is specific timing. You are here tonight, or watching tonight, or at some point in the future, perhaps even by CD or DVD, because God is working his plan in your life. Number three, just like with Paul, a specific location, with us there are specific places. Have you ever thought about that? We sort of plan our lives, we decide when we're going to go on vacation, we decide whether or not we're going to go to the store, which store we're going to go to, when we're going to go to the store, what we're going to buy when we get at the store, whether or not we're going to do this, that, or the other thing, whether we're going to sleep in in the morning, whether or not we're going to leave the house at 9 o'clock or 9.05 or 9.15. You've been at thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of locations at different times in your life. As God weaves his plan, now listen, as God weaves his plan for all of human history. Did you know that you are one specific thread in his plan for human history that makes you and me rather important because God has a very detailed plan. He's not just saying, okay, well, let's have a world war. Oh, you know, those guys can do whatever they want, kill each other, and then, you know, one of these days somebody will stop it. God has a specific plan, and it includes everything in your life because he's weaving human history for the greatest maximum amount of his own glory. He's not just weaving your life, he's weaving your life into human history. Your life is an essential thread in the divine tapestry of eternity. Let me illustrate. Some of you say, well, yeah, you can say that about things like your, your two trips to China or your year in Israel. And both of those clearly had visible life-altering consequences, like the trip to Israel. That's where God gave me my wife. 
My trip to China, that's where God gave me two grandchildren. It's not just those kinds of trips. Those had clearly visible life-altering consequences. But did you know your trip to Florida did too? Your trip to the shore. Your trip to Hershey Park. Your trip to the Creation Museum, for those of you who went. Your trip to the grocery store. Your trip to the bank. Your trip to the gas station. There are no accidents in the plan of God. There are no irrelevant events. Do you know why there was a detour on the road down here in Haddon Township, right across this corner from the front of the church here, and why you had to take a detour around if you drove down that way for the last week or so? There are no accidents in the plan of God. God was working something in human history through that. You may not know it right now, but God was. We don't know. But someday we'll find out as we are amazed at what was God doing. Why are there detours in life? Paul had to take some detours here. The ship didn't get to sail exactly where it wanted to sail and as fast as it wanted to sail because God was going to make sure that ship was in a specific location in the middle of the ocean when he sent a divinely ordained storm because he had a purpose for the people on board the ship and he had the purpose for a certain group of people on an island and a certain guy by the name of Publius whose father had a bloody flux whom Paul was going to heal and through that a whole group of people were going to come to Christ you don't know what the little details that are happening in your life are going to ultimately culminate in but God does he makes no mistakes there are no accidents in the plan of God we see things are being set here for the next two chapters with very specific details and that's why we are given all the details it doesn't just say Paul sailed to Rome and there was a storm in the middle no accidents in the plan of God no irrelevant events no worthless experiences you think well that was a worthless experience <laughs> no there are no worthless experiences if we view them from the divine perspective and if we ask the question what is God trying to teach us? Do you know why he allows delays in your life? Well, perhaps it might be to teach you patience. Some of us have a very impatient spirit. I have found myself very impatient at certain times in my life because it bugs me the things drag like they do. If you're in ministry, you will understand that. Why does everybody drag their feet so much? You know, God is less concerned about why they're dragging their feet. He's less concerned about that than he is about how am I going to deal with it? Will I be long-suffering? Will I be patient when circumstances don't work out the way I want them to work out? Because you see, he is developing in me and in you the character of Christ. Even the delays in life, if we ask, Lord, what are you teaching me through this? I have a purpose in the divine plan. Number four. First was temporal items. Second was specific timing. Third is specific places, everything and everywhere you go. Number four is specific people who are going to make an impact on our lives. That was like the centurion. That was a man who was going to have a specific impact on the life of Paul. Have you ever wondered why God gave you the parents and the ancestors that he gave you? Some folks complain about it. They complain about their physical heritage. Perhaps they complain about the color of their skin or their height or their shortness or the stocky build with which they were born that they can't seem to get rid of through dieting <laughs> they don't like the color of their eyes they don't like the color of their hair you know have you ever wondered why God gave you the parents and the ancestors that you have we all go back to Noah and his three sons and their wives and through Noah go back all the way to Adam why did God give us those parents? Why did he give us the teachers that we have? I know some of you are asking the question, why in the world did he give us the pastor that we have? Or the other pastors, or maybe you've been to other churches. Why did he give me those pastors in that church? 
Was God teaching you something? How about the friends? Why did God give you the friends that you've got? Maybe as you were growing up, you wished that you could be with a certain clique of people, a certain group of people that you really wanted to be in group. You wanted to have friends with those and all you seemed to get were the rejects. Or maybe you were in the in group and now you look back and you say, man, I learned some things with the in group that I really wish I hadn't learned. I did some things with the in group that really probably weren't that good for me to be doing. You know, there are specific people who are making an impact on your life, who have made, who are going to make. How about your relatives, including your in-laws and outlaws? How about your enemies? Why did God give you the enemies that you've got? What's he trying to teach you? You know, God is using people to make an impact on your life because he is developing the character of Christ in you? How about your employees or your employers? You look back over your employment history, the people for whom you have worked and the people who have worked for you. Why did those people get put either in a position of authority over you or in a position under you? Was God doing something? Yes, he was. Do you know what it was? Were you paying attention to what God was trying to teach you through that? Are you paying attention to it now? The people that made an impact on your life, how about the people who encouraged you? We all like those. Okay, how about the people who irritate you? Why did God bring those sources of irritation into your life? Did you know that every one of them is being used by God to rub off your rough edges, to build you up, and to conform you into the image of Christ. We see those kinds of things happening with the Apostle Paul and all the people on that ship. They are all stuck together on this little boat that was just over 200 people. It's not like one of the big ocean liners. I've been on a couple of those which have 5,000 staff on the ocean liner in addition to all the passengers. God put 200 people on board a tiny vessel and they were all going to run into each other at one point or another during that journey. That brings us to number five. Number four was specific people who are going to make an impact on our lives. But number five is the specific people upon whom God will use us to make an impact. Not only do they affect us, we affect them. Did you know that you have a divine obligation to make an impact on every person with whom you come into contact in your entire life? Yes. A divine obligation to make an impact on every person with whom you come in contact. Why? Because your life is ordered by God and so is the life of every person on the planet you have no accidental contacts with other people. Did you know that? If you really believe in the sovereignty of God, you understand that you have no accidental contacts with other people. Think about your day. Your day today, your day yesterday. Think about all the days of your life so far. <clears throat> what kind of an impact did you make by what you said? by what you did, and perhaps more importantly, what kind of an impact did you make by the attitudes that you had even to casual observers? I know you've all walked through a store at one point or another, and you've seen a parent trying to deal with a recalcitrant child. Some kid who's yelling and screaming, taking cans off the shelf and throwing them down on the floor, are yelling and screaming, Mommy, I want this. Mommy, I want this. Mommy, I want this. And then you looked and you saw how that person reacted to his or her child or grandchild. There are casual observers who are watching every move you make. And some of them even come up to you and make comment about it. I've certainly had that happen to me, or total strangers will make a comment to me about something I was wearing, for example, or something that I said, or a comment that I made to the cashier, 
about it is sure good to be alive today. Every day that God gives us is a good day to be alive. And I've made comments like that to various cashiers as I've gone out. I've seen them with gloomy faces and so on. And somebody else in line will say, Amen, brother. Or, that's what Jesus would say. I, I didn't realize it, but I just gave an encouragement to a Christian standing behind me. Or perhaps to some pagan standing behind me who was having a gloomy day and really was perhaps even contemplating suicide. And they heard, you know, every day that you're alive is a good day. Someday we'll know who the casual observers were that heard our words, that saw our actions, that perceived our attitudes. How about when you get an extra nickel in change or even an extra penny? And you think to you, oh, well, it's only a penny. And you stick it in your pocket. I know you think I'm a fanatic on this. I've said it before. If I perceive that I've been given too much money back, I take it back and I hand it to the cashier and they always say, what, you brought back a penny or something like that? I say, we see I'm a Christian and God counts even the pennies. I do this because I believe there's a living God to whom we must all give an account. I give something, I tell them something like that. And they always look shocked. They'd never thought of that before. Maybe there's another person standing at the cash register while I say that. They see it, they hear it. When they don't charge you quite enough, you say, wow, I just got a deal. Or do you go back, and I've done this. In fact, not too long ago, down at Aldi's. They hadn't charged me for enough items. I had bought multiple things of some particular item, and I counted them up, and I counted the ones I had in the basket. They hadn't charged me for one of them. I went back in and paid them the dollar and 32 cents or whatever it was, and the cashier said, well, thank you very much. Do you then give a testimony? Well, you see, I'm a Christian. God will hold me accountable for this. These are his resources. That might keep them from doing something in the future that they would later regret. Or give them encouragement that, yes, being a Christian does mean a changed life. You are making impact on the lives of other people even with the so-called little things. There are no accidental contacts in your life in the plan of God. But what do they see? Do they see you whining or fussing or shouting or pouting or swearing or praising God or smiling, frowning, resisting, obeying? Were you, as Paul tells us we must be, were you a living epistle known and read of all men? That's what Paul said about the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 3, 2. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ. You are a letter, just like the Bible. You are manifestly, that means you are openly seen by other people. They don't see your Bible. They probably don't even have a Bible at home, but they're going to see you. You are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. Paul wrote that to Corinth. That was a bad church, folks. That was a church that was filled with lawsuits between believers. That was a church that was filled with incest. That was a church that was filled with arguments about baptism. That was a church that was filled with all kinds of horrible sin. They got drunk at the Lord's table. They didn't do what God told them to do. It was a bad church. Paul says, don't you understand? You're an epistle of Christ. You are known and read by everybody who sees you. There are no accidents in our lives, folks. Paul, when he got on that ship, there were those who had made an impact on his life, but everybody on that ship had his or her life impacted by the Apostle Paul. You are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone. This is not the law. You are not under the law. You are not out there banging people over the head with the law. You don't take the tables of stone and smash them and say, Commandment 1, Commandment 2, Commandment 3. 
Yours is a fleshly table of the heart. Not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. You are being read every day of your life. You have been read every day of your life up to this point by somebody. What impact did you make? I want to spend a little more time on the last two next week, but let me at least give them to you so you have all seven. Number six, specific destinations and goals. Specific destinations and goals. There is a specific destination and a goal when we look at the passage with Paul. The destination was Rome. The goal was preaching the gospel to Caesar. There are specific destinations and goals. That deals with God's plan for your life. We'll talk more about that next week. That's a way too big subject for tonight. Number seven. Specific supernatural elements. Specific supernatural elements that cannot happen by chance when connected to everything else. Specific supernatural elements that cannot happen by chance when connected to everything else like the storm Eurachlidon, which comes down upon them when it does. Each of the winds that blew to make sure that they were in the middle of the ocean when that storm hit and drove them a specific direction. You've got some supernatural elements in your life. Do you perceive when those are happening? I've seen that sometimes with shudder, sometimes with joy. When I look at my life and the way God ordered my life, and what he did. Things that happen in your life that can't be explained any other way than by supernatural intervention. I've told you this story before. I'll give it to you in closing. When my dad was in the military in World War II, he was stationed down in South America. One day they were given leave. They went down to the coast. They went swimming. My dad was a strong swimmer. He swam far out into the ocean. Then he turned around and he was going to swim back, but the tide was against him and he couldn't get back. No matter how hard he struggled, he couldn't get back. The tide was going out, he couldn't get back. He was almost at the point of exhaustion, perhaps half a mile offshore. But suddenly a guy showed up right next to him, some blonde guy that he'd never seen before in his life and never saw after that. The guy swam up to him and said, need some help, buddy? Dad said, yeah. The guy took his hand, gave my dad a shove on the next wave, which carried him all the way to shore. God sends his angels to be ministering spirits to us who shall be the heirs of salvation. From that point on, I look and see the ministry that God gave to my father, the impact that he has made on literally millions of people around the world. There are things that cannot be explained by reason. Things that God works out in our lives whereby there is supernatural intervention at precisely the point in our life when we need it. Maybe that was just another human being. But he showed up in a gigantic ocean right next to a man who is in desperate need of help at a precise point in history and gave him just the shove that he needed to get all the way back to shore. Are you perceptive about what God is doing in your life that is supernatural? Satan is definitely trying to do supernatural things in your life to lead you the wrong direction. Are you aware of what God is doing? We've talked about the spiritual warfare this morning. You are a soldier in battle. You are important to your commander in chief. And how you respond to life determines whether you win the fight or you lose. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the specifics that we see in this passage before us tonight. 
things that when we analyze them, we discover those are the things that you are also doing in our lives. Because you are the God of all of history. And each one of us are your children. We're not numbers. You even call the stars by name. You know us by name. You have specific plans for us that are good and not evil. Plans to prosper us. Help us to learn to pay attention because nothing ever happens by accident. It only happens according to your direction, your loving care, and your plan in the infinite tapestry of eternity for the glory of Jesus Christ. And for this we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.